Hello everyone, my name is Philip Plato. Uh, this is a summary of the presentation that was made uh, on Wednesday the 5th of June at the Memorial Hall uh, Lay Hill near Chesham by Brown Not Green. It was hoped that we could record live and then publish these slides uh, for those who were unable to attend the meeting, but unfortunately technical difficulties meant that it was necessary for me to record um, my presentation over the slides. Consequently, what you're about to see and hear is not a live recording, but a summary of the presentation. As I have already explained, my name is Philip Plato. I'm the chairman of Brown Not Green, and I'm a chartered planning surveyor who happens to live uh, locally at Lie Green. At the meeting in the Lay Hill Memorial Hall, which was packed, I asked for a quick show of hands as to who had been to a Brown Not Green open meeting previously, and in particular as a result of the recent announcements um, about the Green Belt and the um, villages that were going to be taken out of Green Belt or permitted for infilling, I asked if uh, who had come from those villages, and there was a considerable show of hands for those attending from the villages such as Ashley Green, Botley, Walpley Hill, etc. The purpose of the meeting uh, is summarised in this slide. Uh, I wanted to spend most of the time advising everybody in the community what Brown Not Green have been doing and specific issues that we've been working on recently, as well as to update everyone on the local plan proposals that have been published in the last couple of weeks and the timetable for the local plan and specifically the main aim is to advise the community how to respond to this consultation process. Um, I also have to make an unashamedly um, blatant plea for funds. The project has become very expensive particularly in result of the need to respond to some of the more recent submissions that have been made by the council and uh, it is starting to get expensive and therefore there is a necessity for us to top up our fundraising efforts that we had undertaken last year and I requested everybody to bear this in mind and that I would be touching on this towards the end of the presentation. Although not shown on the slide I also pointed out that we've had um, a bit of a problem with some of our volunteers who through no fault of their own have been indisposed and we therefore were requesting if there was anyone who could offer any assistance to our organising committee and in particular we are looking for someone who could manage the social media channels for Brown Not Green. So turning to the next slide uh, I started by explaining what Brown Not Green have been doing in the last 18 months or so since the last major um, public open meeting. Um, at that meeting I had indicated that we were hoping to retain um, a barrister from Landmark Chambers and indeed that has now taken place. Sasha Blackmore, who is an experienced barrister within Landmark Chambers, uh, has been retained and the directors of Brown Not Green had a formal consultation uh, with her, an initial consultation on um, in October of last year. However, on Council's advice, um, we have felt, felt it necessary to appoint some uh, independent expert consultants to provide professional reports uh, providing evidence that the barrister feels that we need on very important topics uh, to underline our case on particular topic matters such as green belt and valued landscapes, traffic generation, air quality and particularly sustainability. Uh, SLR Consulting is a, a global multidisciplinary firm and this is partly the reason why we will be making a plea for funds uh, later on because this was not envisaged when we first um, decided to appoint legal representation. We've also had to retain solicitors, uh, specifically David jones Bull, who are specialist property solicitors, um, as we needed certain advice on particular issues, notably in respect of trespass, prescriptive rights and other matters pertaining to our application for assets of community value which I will be explaining later on. We've also tried to maintain contact with the local press 
Um, many of you may have seen a recent double page spread in your Chesham uh, reporting on the recent events uh, with the council meetings, but we've also um, managed to get some airtime on BBC Three Counties Radio on the 15th of May, the highlights of which incidentally are available to review on the Brown Not Green website. And we've also been active in taking part in a number of consultations in the last 18 months, the most important of which was the government's uh, consultation to revise national planning policy framework, but we've also undertaken a part in local consultations through the local authority with regards to their community infrastructure levy, uh, Brownfield Register, and we've been also working very closely with the Chesham Renaissance Community Interest Company Master Plan. These matters aside, we've also been very active on a number of very special projects. On the 29th of April, we made an application under Section 88 of the Localism Act 2011 for the listing of land at Lie Green as an asset of community value. An asset of community value is defined as land or buildings that improves the well-being of the community and is likely to continue to do so for the next five years. This application was made on the basis that we have established that for decades the land at Lie Green has been used for indoor, informal outdoor recreation such as dog walking, kite flying, hiking, and a variety of other informal uh, purposes. Significantly, these recreational uses have not been confined to the public footpaths and has gone on for decades. I think it's necessary to explain what an asset of community value actually is and what does it mean. Effectively, once a, an asset, which can be either land or buildings, is listed, it gives the community or the person making the application the right to bid for the land for five years. Um, we have done this because Brown Not Green feel that the only definite certain way that we can assure that the land would not be developed is if it came into community ownership. Now once an asset is listed, uh, as I say that listing would last for five years and there is nothing in the Act to stop the um, applicant making a further application in another five years. So provided nothing changes, uh, that could certainly be the strategy to uh, apply again. But any time during that five years, the landowner cannot sell to anyone else without first giving uh, the person with the benefit of the listing the right to bid for the property uh, it's subject to a six month notice period. I have to stress that the landowner is not obliged to accept our bid, but uh, it does provide a moratorium during which the community can get its funds together to uh, see if it can secure the funds to acquire the asset. As important as it is uh, for the community to try to secure the property, um, there is another benefit of seeking to have the asset listed as being of asset of community value. This is because the listing itself would be a material planning consideration for the planning inspector. Uh, we are advised by our barrister that this could be of some weight, uh, particularly following the important case that went to the Court of Appeal um, in St Albans just last year. There are a lot of similarities between the situation at Lie Green and the case at St Albans and therefore our, bar our barrister felt that it was important for us to make this application, which we did, um, in late April and the application was validated on the 9th of May. Uh, there then has to be a decision made by the local authority within eight weeks. That decision, if there is no land owner objection, will be made therefore by the 4th of July. If there is an objection, there will be a hearing and the process will take a little longer. Indeed, if you zoom in, you will see that the enlarged images show very clearly these footpaths and indeed in some you can even see people walking on the footpaths. Now aside from these Google Earth images we've submitted some 70 photographs, most of them taken at ground level, showing not only the paths but various different recreational uses taking place. Uh, these include people walking their dogs, running, walking or just simply strolling with their children and families, various people hiking, scouting or doing their Duke of Edinburgh awards, um, and the, this application and these photographs 
have also been supported by over 60 letters and statements of truth from members of the public who've been able to confirm either that they've um, seen people doing this or they've done it for them, themselves for more than 20 years. Now I think it's important to stress that even if this application is going to be taken seriously, which we hope it will, um, and it certainly think we think it could be significant, um, we cannot rely on it being the uh, sole reason for having the land removed from the local plan. Consequently, we are also working on a couple of other related matters that would support the Section 88 application, but which of themselves might also provide um, other material considerations for the inspector to consider on this land. The first of these would be to establish prescriptive rights for any homeowners that have rear garden gates that border the fields and provide access to the fields. Um, we're also looking to get more public rights of way adopted on the land, uh, specifically those well-trodden tracks that I showed you in the previous slides that are not already public rights of way. We're going to seek an application under the um, modification of definitive map procedures to see if we can have these uh, added as adopted public rights of way. Uh, both of these strategies um, will um, increase the questions about the deliverability of this site if there are many people who have rights across the land. And in this respect, I must ask anyone who has attended the meeting or who is listening to this presentation, if you have lived in the area uh, for a long period of time and have seen people walking not just on the public footpaths but elsewhere on the land, we would like to hear from you because a, a statement could, could form part of the evidence of many other statements uh, that would hopefully help in getting us um, the modification of the definitive map approved. It's not a quick process, it could take over 12 months, but we'd like to get the application in now. We also want to hear from people who've got rear garden gates that provide access into the fields. Uh, if those gates have been in existence for 20 years, um, we definitely want to hear from you, so please get in touch. We now want to consider what the Council have been doing in the last 18 months or so. Well, there hasn't actually been a great deal of activity during that period of time. Uh, very little appeared in the Council's evidence base. But then in early April we noticed that some councillors were receiving briefing packs with their agendas for forthcoming meetings at the end of the month or early May. Um, these briefing packs were some 360 odd pages and clearly it contained a document that looked very much like the draft local plan. Um, it was clear that therefore that councillors were going to be asked to approve this in the near future or at the date shown on their respective agendas. And as those meetings, meeting dates came up, we started to notice new evidence, some of it long awaited, adding into the council's evidence base, but most of it only appeared between the 10th and 13th of May, i.e. a day or two before the councillors had their formal full council meetings. Now these briefing packs and the agendas the councillors received were basically asking them to approve the draft local plan for what's known as the Regulation 19 consultation process. Um, this is the final consultation process that the public is afforded um, and thereafter the plan would then be sent for future scrutiny by an independent planning inspector. Uh, the planning inspector is uh, appointed from the planning in inspectorate service that are based in Bristol. Um, we noted that the proposals uh, in the draft local plan sadly included the removal of 13 greenbelt sites for development in the combined districts of Chiltern and South Bucks. However, we were more concerned to note that in respect of the uh, area at Lie Green that has been the subject of our focus for the last few years, that all of that site, some 60 hectares, is still being proposed for removal from greenbelt designation and specifically that there is now proposals for development of 500 homes, uh, a community hub with a 5,000 square foot retail store and 15 gypsy traveller pitches. What did come as a bit of a shock however was a proposal for the removal of 12 villages from Greenbelt designation. This had not been suggested previously as far as I can see 
and the villages, uh, as I say, are 12, but there are they include Botley and Layhill and Hyde Heath. So there are villages around Chesham that will clearly be affected by this. In addition, there was another surprise in that a policy appeared that would approve planning applications for infilling uh, within 21 villages currently washed over by Greenbelt policy. And these include villages such as Ashley Green, Cheneys and Welpley Hill. So again, there is further threats to the community around Chesham. Now, although Brown Not Green has been very focused on the Greenbelt proposals in the plan, it also became very apparent that the draft local plan included some retail-led development opportunities that also give us some concern. Proposals are being um, advanced for new retail development on the car parks at Star, y Star Yard and Darvell's Bakery. Um, that's nearly 60,000 square feet of retail, plus another 27,000 square feet uh, on the Coal Yard and Station car park in, in Chesham. And in addition, there was reference to a large food store being developed at 31 Red Lion Street. Uh, this could potentially be 27,000 square feet. Um, this is the job centre and the Water Meadow surgery site and is of great concern. Uh, we cannot understand this, uh, A, as there was no warning, and B, because we just don't think it is justified. We all know what's happening to retail at the moment, and it seems inconceivable that the uh, town would want such a significant increase in shops when we're having trouble filling the existing shops in the high street. Leaving that aside, even if one can find tenants or occupiers for these shops, where are the customers going to park? And also, where are the lorries that service these shops, and particularly the large food store, uh, going to uh, gain access? We are particularly concerned by the potential cumulative effects. If Lie Green is developed, we, all, we are already proposing that there is going to be a significant increase in traffic which will further add to the congestion in the town. If we've now got uh, additional food stores or other shops that would be generating traffic, hopefully from visiting customers, this will only make matters worse. Basically, we feel that these proposals are unsound and you may therefore want to include these in your representations uh, if you choose to make them in the Regulation 19 process. And in respect of this retail uh, led opportunities that the local plan has identified. I've just shown on this slide an extract or the extracts from the plan uh, where this is referred to. Um, the policy uh, reference number is SPEP3 on page 120 and the reference to the large food store in Red Lion Street is on page 118. I think it is also worth commenting that there does appear to be a disproportionate impact upon Chesham. Uh, within this policy, we can see that uh, other towns are mentioned where there are retail development opportunities, um, but the, the size of these is considerably smaller than Chesham, which seems to be bearing a considerable burden for the, this retail provision. One has to ask, why are other towns in the district going to be denied these retail-led opportunities? Um, we just don't think this is justified. Now this slide just shows two of the villages that are affected by the Greenbelt policies that I outlined earlier. Uh, as I said, we had no warning of these and uh, although I can't show all the villages on the slides, there's over 30 of them, um, these plans show just Ashley Green and Welpley Hill. Uh, but I believe that the, uh, these are typical of the villages that are being affected by these um, new policies. Um, you will note that there are quite large gardens and houses and areas of green space and indeed village greens. Um, the concern is that these will come under threat uh, when these policies come into effect. I think the residents of these villages do have genuine cause for concern. There is clearly potential for a builder buying one of these houses, knocking the house down and building two uh, or if he buys the house next door and creates an even larger plot, there's potential for four, five or six homes where perhaps only two previously prevailed. Um, I do think this is unjustified and I would strongly recommend to those villagers uh, who may want to make re representations uh, to comment upon this. Um, 
you could summarize it as saying goodbye to town planning and hello to ta village cramming. Um, some of the points, though, that perhaps might need to be made and investigated further is whether any of these villages have conservation areas. Um, the residents within the villages might like to consider what we've done in terms of assets of community value listing, and if they have a village green, they might want to consider having that registered too. Um, these would be effective measures, I think, in at least um, uh, curtailing um, some of the development pressure. Um, but the better yet, I think it would be uh, more prudent to try to have these policies overturned. Because again, I do not think that they are justified and um, it is hard to, to quantify how much housing provision is going to come from these policies and therefore if it cannot be quantified, how can it be justified? Now you may be wondering how these new policies came about. Candidly, we don't really know because some of them we've had no warning of whatsoever. But the full council meetings were held by South Bucks and Chiltern District Councils on the 14th and 15th of May respectively. Uh, I attended both of these meetings um, and I think it would be helpful if I gave you a brief report on the uh, discussions that took place at them both. Self-evidently both councils voted to approve the draft local plan for publication and moving on into the Regulation 19 consultation process. Brownlock Green requested a recorded vote which means that we were able to get a record of every individual councillor as to how they voted, whether it was for, against or whether they abstained. And you can see here on the slide that in South Bucks District Council, 18 councillors voted for, five voted against with three abstainers. Chilton had a slightly different uh, profile with 31 councillors voting for the plan, two voting against and with no abstainers. Uh, there were, I think, about four councillors absent from the Chilton meeting um, and we are posting the names of the councillors and how they voted on the Brown Not Green website. Uh, we are suggesting that local people may wish to reflect on this when some of these councillors come asking for your votes on the new Unitary Authority next year. On a personal note, I found it curious that so many councillors got to their feet and addressed the public gallery, particularly in the Chilton District Council meeting, and it's expressed serious reservations about the plan, but then voted for it. I understand that those who voted against the plan uh, in South Bucks were uh, expelled from the party, uh, and that may well be true in Chilton too, but I believe uh, I've, I've heard from good authority that councillors were voting under a three-line whip to vote the plan through. Uh, although I've been rather critical of the councils, I think it is notable that um, councillors Garth and councillors Harold both voted against the plan. Uh, indeed, councillor Harold spoke at some length and quite eloquently uh, against the uh, plan, and um, I think they should be commended for that. Um, I also must go on record for thanking councillor Mark Shaw. Councillor Mark Shaw is also a Bucks County councillor and although he was not attending the Chiltern District Council uh, meeting on the 15th of May, he has been very supportive and uh, agrees with us and has similar concerns to us about the loss of Greenbelt um, and particularly the effects of the loss of Greenbelt around Chesham. Accordingly, I felt it only right to highlight his contribution to our cause. I think I should also recite some of the comments that were made by councillors when approving the plan. Uh, there are five main headings. The first one is that only 2.7% of Greenbelt in the district is going to be lost, and the implication being that there's still plenty of Greenbelt for everyone to still enjoy. Um, I feel that misses the point. One of the key features of Greenbelt designations is its permanence. It also fails to recognise the fact, or the question I should say, as to whether these are the right sites. In particular, 13 Greenbelt sites have been removed that represent this 2.7%. Are they the right areas? Brown Not Green has serious concerns about the methodology by which the Greenbelt areas have been selected. The next reason recited by many councillors was that our existing plan is so out of date 
that unscrupulous developers will get consent for all sorts of bad schemes at appeal. This was mockingly referred to by Councillor Harold as planning Armageddon, and I think he was right to mock it, because it is a bit of a half-truth. I should also say that if the plan is so out of date, whose fault is that? It is the councillors who set the pace on this, and they really could have approved a plan many years previously, possibly with lower housing figures and uh, than, than the ones we are facing now following the revised methodology. But leaving that aside, the suggestion that the absence of a plan means that there is a complete absence of any planning restraint policy is absolutely untrue. We still have the National Planning Policy Framework, we still have Greenbelt policies and other policies of development constraint, and indeed in the planning press I read on a number of occasions where applicants go to appeal and the inspector either does not grant what they want or grants it with serious conditions or changes and uh, I therefore think that this is disingenuous. Another popular reason that was recited by various councillors was if we don't approve this plan anonymous civil servants in central government will write one for us. Again I cannot accept this it is, as it is a half-truth at best. There is a new unitary authority taking over next year and it seems inconceivable that the government would, if the, if the local council had seen fit to reject the local plan, uh, appoint someone to uh, in, instill a policy in the nine or ten months between now and when the unitary authority comes into being. But even if I'm wrong on that, the fact is that the implication that councillors know best and know the best policies for the local plan um, is again slightly disingenuous because they are not writing the plan. The planning officers are, and most of the planning officers are not local people. Uh, the senior planning officers in Chiltern District Council are all relatively recent uh, additions to the team. Uh, they arrived in just September of last year, and when I've researched their backgrounds on LinkedIn, they have not got local connections to this area. Um, they've come from other areas, and it is inconceivable, therefore, that they would have a deep understanding uh, of the area uh, and that they would know better than us or um, the people who are living near these sites. So again, I cannot accept that reason as being valid. A further reason that was being um, advanced for approving this plan was the assertion that the plan is born from many years of professional research and expert advice. The implication being that we know nothing and that the experts know best. I'm tempted to say that the many years of professional research and expert advice that went into HS2 or other projects such as Crossrail or any number of government IT projects that we've all seen fail over the years also claim to have been born by many years of professional research and expert advice so I find it hard to accept this either. And the last of the most popular reasons that were recited for approving the plan was simply it's the least worst option and that their officers have advised them to approve this plan. Hardly a glowing endorsement, the least worst option. I submit that this is simply not good enough. The community deserves better. This is the most important policy that councillors uh, will approve that will shape our lives and those of our children for the next 20 years. And to describe it and endorse something that is the least worst option is really not acceptable. Now returning now to the specifics of the site at Lie Green, uh, this slide shows the extract from the draft local plan and the red line denotes the area in which these 500 homes, the community hub, the store and the gypsy sites would be located. However, do not be fooled, the whole of this land is being removed from Greenbelt and the area marked with the red arrow in the slide is uh, coming out of Greenbelt but is not being earmarked for any development for now. The question lingers, what is going to go here in a few years time? Once it's taken out of Greenbelt protection it will be under threat. So here we are, we're back really to where we started um, some four years ago when this site was first proposed for Greenbelt removal. The whole of this land edged red and shaded green being removed from Greenbelt designation. Uh, we have since established or are contending that it is an asset of community value and it is notable that there is very little detail in the plan 
on other matters that might be of concern to us, such as access, flooding, drainage, landscaping, uh, building density, building height, layout, etc. We were potentially supposed to be reassured by um, assertions made at the council meetings that there will yet be a master plan that will follow after the plan is uh, approved. Um, and the councillors promised us that we will be consulted upon uh, on these issues. Um, I really think that that is unacceptable. It's a bit like asking a condemned man whether he wants to be hung or shot. It's too late. We are really fearful upon the effects of the removal of this site from Greenbelt upon the wider town, particularly in terms of traffic congestion, air quality, and the loss of Lie, and the loss of the Lie Green village, which will just morph into part of Greater Chesham. Councillors say the site will be sustainable, and that their their evidence appears to be merely suggestions of installing a bus stop and upgrading the footpaths within the site so that people could cycle. But the fact is inescapable. It is too far from the town centre and up a very steep hill uh, as well. Um, it is nearly two and a half kilometres measured from the middle of the site to the town centre and the tube station. And we feel this is just too far and it will, if developed, just result in increased car journeys. So what happens now? The timetable for the local plan is as follows. On Friday the 7th of June, shortly after this meeting, the plan is going to be officially published. You'll be able to go onto the Chiltern or South Bucks district websites and download a copy and review it at your leisure. The publication triggers the start of the six weeks Regulation 19 consultation period, which I've calculated means it runs until the 19th of July. Accordingly, any public comments need to be filed before the 19th of July to ensure that they are considered. This is the last chance for the public to make any comment on the plan, although I should warn everybody that it is not likely that the local authority will make any substantive alterations to the local plan. They basically receive the comments from the community and they will tabulate them, collate them and then send them to the planning inspectorate for the planning inspector to view in due course. However, I must stress it is important for you to respond. Not only will your comments be reviewed by the inspector, but they effectively give you the opportunity to make further comments if the inspector invites it at the inquiry stage. Once the consultation closes, there will then be a period for the local authority to uh, collate all these presumably thousands of responses that they are going to get. It's quite a big job. And uh, once they've um, categorized them all and uh, tabulated them, uh, they will then, as I said, send them off to the planning inspectorate and they've indicated they're going to do this in September. Um, <clears throat> the dates that I've shown in italics and a slightly different colour in this slide is purely to indicate the fact that there is nothing certain about the dates um, thereafter because uh, certainly after the uh, comments have been submitted to the inspectorate, the matter is then in the hands of the planning inspectorate. Uh, planning officers have told me that they do in expect the inspector will be appointed and that an inquiry will start uh, in December of this year. Um, but I am hearing that in fact that there may be some delays, but uh, I presume that the council officers have got a better contact with the inspectorate than myself. It is therefore realistic, I think, to expect that the plan uh, may be subject to independent scrutiny uh, during December to March. Um, and after the inquiry concludes, the inspector will then um, consider uh, his or her report, uh, which may take itself several months to be prepared, but it's hoped that the inspector will provide his or her report by October 2020 and that the plan will then be ad adopted once any uh, alterations that the inspector recommends um, are applied. Uh, the key point to note here is, of course, that Chiltern and South Bucks district councils will cease to exist from the 31st of March next year, and it will be up to the new unitary authority to adopt this plan. As I have mentioned, after Friday the 7th of June, the consultation period will start. It lasts for six weeks, and it is really important that the community gets involved. Making a Regulation 19 com comment 
uh, will assure you the right to make future submissions to the inspector. Though I must manage your expect expectations a little bit and point out that the inquiry is primarily a written process. Uh, you're strongly advised, therefore, to make comments uh, in the process by the 19th of July, and it is a strict timetable. Comments received on the 20th will not be included. Um, it's a slightly different process to making comments to the previous Regulation 18 and non-statutory consultations, and therefore Brown Not Green have prepared some guidance notes uh, on our website, but also the Council are preparing guidance notes, which is uh, part of the process anyway. Um, so between those two resources, hopefully there will be plenty of information to explain how you, how you do it. However, just to illustrate matters further, this slide shows an extract from one of the, or uh, part of the document that is on the Brown Not Green website. Um, and it's important for everyone to understand that you have to shape your submissions uh, trying to answer this test as to whether the plan is sound. Now, I've highlighted on this slide and, and on the guidance notes on the Brown Not Green website keywords and phrases that you need to focus on when making a submission. The concept of soundness can be confusing to some people, and there are basically four components that determine whether um, a policy or a plan is sound, and any one of these can uh, result in the conclusion that the policy or the plan itself is unsound. Uh, the four criteria are that the plan or the policy must be positively prepared, um, it must be justified, it must be effective and consistent with national policy. And the slide recites the basic definitions of those terms. Now in terms of what to put in your submission, <clears throat> it may be appropriate for me to just highlight some of the key issues that you might want to consider. These are just some of them, and indeed you may have your own points that you want to make. But we feel that these are perhaps some of the more important issues, um, issues about sustainability, principally defined as the distance from the town centre and whether it's going to result in people uh, using their cars more, uh, and consequently any effects on air quality and traffic congestion. Site selection is also an issue. We are particularly concerned about the uh, process for selecting green belt sites for the consideration um, and the effects of sprawl and the coalescence of settlements, bearing in mind that one of the pur purposes of green belt is to prevent the coalescence of settlements and uh, outward sprawl of the urban area. Issues of draining, drainage and flooding may also be relevant as they are uh, particularly of interest to residents of Chesham. And uh, some of you may also have concerns about wildlife. Um, I know that certain people have voiced to me concerns about uh, some of the uh, birds and mammals that they have observed uh, that have made uh, their natural habitat um, on the land at Lie Green. Uh, but the last one I have emboldened because I think it is particularly relevant, namely exceptional circumstances for Greenbelt modification. I'm going to talk further about this later, so I won't talk too much about it now. However, when you look at the example on the Brown Not Green website, uh, as in the previous slide, I have emboldened certain words and phrases that may be helpful to you. Now, without wishing to lead anyone in their submissions, and I must stress that you must use your own words and your own thoughts. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to try and illustrate uh, how one uh, creates this picture of whether a policy is sound or not uh, by reference to the earlier slides. And as an example, let's just take the issue of sustainability, which is an issue that appears in the National Planning Policy Framework in Section 9. So if you were responding on a policy that where you had concerns about sustainability, this is the sort of an example of how you might phrase or shape the uh, submission. Um, this is an example. The plan is unsound because it proposes unsustainable locations for housing development. And insofar as it proposes a greenbelt site northeast of Chesham for housing, that site is unsustainable, being too far from the train station and town centre and due to the steep hills around it that will only promote increased car usage, leading to more traffic congestion and further degraded air quality. It is therefore inconsistent with the National Planning Policy Framework. You might want to consider a further example, namely the topic of Greenbelt site selection. Here you might want to comment something like this. 
The plan is unsound because the Greenbelt site selection process was flawed. With reference to the choice of the Greenbelt site northeast of Chesham, that site is not justified for Greenbelt re release because it fulfills several of the main aims of Greenbelt designation. Yet other reasonable alternative options exist, such as increased density of building on brownfield locations elsewhere, which are at more sustainable locations. Accordingly, this Greenbelt site selection would be inconsistent with National Planning Policy Framework. The choice of site is not effective because it is not deliverable. You might care to then mention issues such as assets of community value, prescriptive rights of way and easements, uh, public rights of way going across the land, and indeed some of you are aware of landowner or one of the landowner statements uh, about his reluctance to release uh, all of the land for development. Now I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk about the exceptional circumstances and uh, I think it would just be sensible for me to just spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Exceptional circumstances are referred to in the National Planning Policy Framework, specifically paragraph 136, which states that once established, Greenbelt boundaries should only be altered where exceptional circumstances are fully evidenced and justified through the preparation or updating of plans. Accordingly, I hope you can see how exceptional circumstances is very important when considering the Greenbelt modifications that are being proposed in this local plan. Now we've heard councillors over the years say that with 88% of the district being covered by Greenbelt, uh, the fact that they have such high housing, unmet housing need uh, is itself exceptional circumstances. Unfortunately, such statements are incorrect. The courts have held that housing need alone is not enough. The key case in this is Gallagher Homes versus Solihull Metropolitan Borough Council in 2014, but there have been others. It is perhaps a little unfortunate that there is no statutory definition of exceptional circumstances and we are left to uh, dwell on uh, the guidance and any court decisions to establish what exceptional circumstances are. But it has been made clear that just housing need alone in an area where there might be Greenbelt policy is not enough. Uh, Brown Not Green has been asking the council officers for the exceptional circumstances that justify the release of the site at Lie Green for many years. They were only published a few weeks ago, just before the council meetings. Uh, we have studied these and the exceptional circumstances seems to be that um, these Greenbelt sites must be released because there is housing need, because there is a lot of Greenbelt constraint and because the council claim that they have identified that some of these or these Greenbelt locations are in their opinion sustainable locations. We beg to differ. We think that the sustainability argument is overstated at best and in any event, we have a new, new revised NPPF, which has further strengthened the criteria for Greenbelt release. Now, the NPPF was revised last year and had some further minor modif modifications more recently. But the latest National Planning Policy Framework has a policy that there is a presumption in favour of sustainable development. That is not particularly new, but the the new wording of paragraph 11b1 effectively directs plan makers to create policies in local plans that are required for their housing and other new uses unless framework policies provide a strong reason for restricting the overall scale type or distribution of development in the plan area. If you look at national planning policy framework there are footnotes to those um, paragraphs and footnote number six makes it very clear that framework policies relating to uh, Greenbelt are considered of importance in relation to this, this guidance. So this raises the question, is the local planning authority really required to meet the objectively assessed need or should the housing need figure be adjusted to reflect the fact that there is Greenbelt constraint in Chiltern District Council? This is certainly an argument that will be advanced before the inspector. I think it's appropriate for me to now comment on the actual physical way that you comment on the local plan. Um, broadly speaking, I think there are going to be three methods. 
Uh, in the past, we've simply just had an online form that you can complete online and email uh, or just press the transmit button back to the local authority. Uh, I would strongly recommend you take a copy before pressing the transmit button though. Uh, you could equally download the form, write upon it and then post it or scan it and email it to the local authority. Uh, equally you could just write a letter or send a submission by post. But the local authority are trying to move away and uh, improve the um, technology with which people can consult and I've been advised that there's a new software called Keystroke Objectives which will be used by the council in this case and uh, I've, I have not used this myself so this is a bit new to me but um, I believe that the process will be that you click on the plan it opens up on your screen and you are then able to make comments using this software that will be relevant for each particular policy which will assist the local authority in collating what your responses are relating to. <clears throat> the more general advice about um, how to comment is also given on the Brown Not Green website um, and uh, there is also a sample representation there but again I must highlight the fact that you should use your own words please don't just copy it uh, it is just an illustration to uh, provoke your own thought processes. In respect of framing your uh, submissions and choosing what to say, uh, it is very difficult to uh, not just be purely negative. Um, and I would encourage you not just to say we don't want you to use the green belt, but perhaps uh, adopt some more positive suggestions. Um, we have always maintained that using brownfield land uh, is better than using green belt. Um, and in response to the notion that uh, there isn't enough brownfield land, well, we would suggest that they should build at higher densities in more sustainable brownfield locations nearer the town centre, such as it recited in the Chesham CIC master plan, um, which we are very supportive of because we feel it offers a genuinely alternative solution to provision of housing in Chesham. And I've put the website link there on the slide. In, indeed, if you click on that uh, website, you will see that this is a copy of their home page where you can read about the master plan and their various policies and their vision, uh, their alternative vision, I should say, uh, for the town. I must stress this is not a council initiative. This is also, like us, a community led organisation, uh, and we just feel that they have an alternative um, approach which we feel it's regrettable that the council have chosen not to adopt. Now I mentioned previously this new software that the council are using for collating um, public comments and responses to the plan uh, that's called Keystroke Objectives. I've not used this before but I tried to look at a couple of other um, alternative local authorities that might be using it and I think what happens um, is that as I've said previously the plan opens and you can comment on in each individual policy. I've tried to show in this slide how it works, but I guess it's much easier to do it uh, on full screen yourselves. And I think um, where I've marked with the red arrow, um, if you were to find a policy that you wanted to comment on, then click on that tab, um, you will find that the, the, the window then opens up to enable you to respond. And on this slide, uh, I've tried to show what it looks like once you've clicked on that tab. There are initially the, the questions about soundness that you're required to answer. And then there is space for you to type uh, your comments. I should also highlight the fact that you can upload a statement and supporting documentation uh, to the plan. And if you look in the uh, right hand corner, uh, just under the add comments tab, um, you can see a little PDF symbol and that is presumably where somebody were responding to this plan has uploaded a PDF uh, statement to, to support their comment. Now as I've had no direct experience with this software myself I think I should point out to you that the local authority have uh, I think very sensibly uh, made arrangements for a couple of 12-hour drop-in sessions um, where there will be a council officer in attendance uh, to advise members of the community 
uh, how to use this and how to make comments in the local plan process. Um, those sessions, as this slide shows, will be on Monday the 17th of June between 9am and 9pm in Amersham and on Wednesday the 19th of June between 9am and 9pm in Denham. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, um, what can you do? Well, as I have already suggested, it is really important that you make your comments to the Regulation 19 consultation before the 19th of July. And as I've also stated, there is guidance on the Brown Not Green website and there will also be guidance available on the Council's website uh, when you click on that. Um, so I commend you to do that. I would also ask you please to support the Brown Not Green Section 88 application for an asset of community value. You still have time to do this. Um, you will, again, you will find the details on the Brown and Green website. Um, I've suggested here that you should not self-incriminate yourself to trespass if you have been walking on the land um, and you haven't lived here more than 20 years and might not have rights of prescription. You would be best advised just to report on what you have seen other people do. I urge you though to get in touch with us if you have lived here for 20 years or more uh, and you can provide any uh, supportive statements about uh, public right-of-way adoption statements uh, or indeed if you've got a garden gate that adjoins the field. We really do want to hear from you. I would urge you to spread the word. This campaign is far from over. There have been reports that the plan has been adopted uh, following the Council's um, meetings in May. That is not correct. Um, we have just moved into this quasi-judicial process called the Regulation 19 process, which will lead up to the public inquiry examination in public. Um, we've still got quite a way to go, but it becomes much more formal now. And as I said at the outset, we urge you now, please, to make further donations to Brown Not Green. Um, forms were handed out at the meeting in the Lay Hill Memorial Hall. Um, but f details are also available, as always, on the Brown Not Green website, and we have recently reactivated our crowdfunding portal. Uh, again, details are on the um, website. Um, this has become an expensive process, and the fact that our barrister is requiring us to get further expert evidence has resulted in us having to make this call for additional funds. Uh, I'm very grateful to everyone who has supported Brown Not Green over the the last three and a half years or so and uh, we are obviously moving now towards the important part of the process. Uh, if anyone wishes to get in touch please use the Brown Not Green website contact us form and we will get back to you. Thank you very much indeed for listening and uh, I wish everyone the very best of luck in the coming months.